This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, an associate professor of preventive medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. Good morning and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking and I'm Dr. Susan Buttress from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Today we're talking about flourishing positive health in every way. We're going to talk, too, about how that happens, why some people experience adversity and still do well, and why some end up not doing well at all. So I'm delighted to say today we have Dr. Christina Bethel from Johns Hopkins, who has spent three decades in researching how we can thrive in the midst of adversity and how we design health care for our communities, how we should train providers. Christy's also had some lived experiences that have given her the deep understanding and the incredible drive to do the work that she does. So welcome, Dr. Bethel. Thank you. It's a joy to be here, Susan. It's a joy to have you. Um, We also have Shoshana Oppenheim, who is a master's student at Johns Hopkins and has joined in the work and been uh, just a wonderful resource for us, too, here in Mississippi. So welcome, Shoshana. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. And we have Dr. Ruth Patterson and nurse practitioner Lauren Elliott, who are on our Mississippi Thrive team, who are sitting in the studio, too. And we, as always, my team, I love, and so happy they're with us. But we have a lot to do um, to talk about today, and and I think there's going to be some great information that we're going to give you listeners today. Send an email to family at MPB online. Dot org. So, Dr. Bethel has been working with our Mississippi Thrive team for the last year and a half as we've worked to design an early child development system for our state. And actually, listeners, a model for the nation. We are very excited about the work, and you'll be hearing more about it as we're moving along. She and Shoshana... Um, have been have come down here to Mississippi to celebrate the formal establishment of the Mississippi Thrive Early Child Development Coalition. And we're having a celebration. Would love for any of you to join us at the Mississippi Children's Museum this evening at 530. So I'm serious about that invitation. Please come if you can. We want to tell you about what we're doing. Um, we aren't done yet. So, as I said in the beginning of the show, we'll be talking about flourishing. And when you hear that word, you might think of having good mental and physical health, but there's more to it. Um, We also have talked before on this show about adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, and, and um, Dr. Bethel, I know your work has contributed to bringing this important issue into public awareness. Um, we know when children and we as adults lack a good, safe, stable place to be, a nurturing relationship and environments that can lead us into the right kind of life, then many times wrong patterns get set up. Mm-hmm chronic stress gets set up and we start struggling. We've talked about not just heart disease, but stroke, diabetes, obesity, mental health issues, so many things that can occur, but it doesn't happen to everybody. So we want to talk to us a little bit about one, how do individuals flourish in amid these adversities? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I mean, it took us a long time to be able to get 
the data to be able to say what you just said was true about adverse childhood experiences and the connections to toxic stress and lifelong health. But the truth is, if you really look at the data, the bulk of people um, don't end up with all of those problems. And so I was curious about why. What is that? And also to recognize that the absence of adversity and illness isn't the same thing as being well. So what is being well? And so when we look at that and talk about this word flourishing amid adversity, Uh, we find things like having a sense of meaning and purpose, being engaged in life, contributing to life, even though things might be hard, and most importantly, establishing and prioritizing relationships and looking for strengths, looking for what can be leveraged and staying hopeful through difficulty. And most importantly, really guarding your own heart in terms of knowing that you matter, that even if you've had adversity and haven't been treated well, that you are valuable and matter and belong. Those things, when we have them, predict whether we li- how long we live amid the same adversity, like 62% more likely to die if you don't have these qualities, even with the same levels of illness and adversity. So what you're saying is that, like we were talking about in the beginning, that individuals who have adversity are not destined to have a bad life as an adult or not destined to have health problems. So so what I really want us to talk about today Mm -hmm. is, is how can we make sure that those children out there Mm -hmm. or those of us who have experienced adversity, how can we develop that resilience so that we can flourish? Uh, Dr. Patterson had mentioned before the show that, you know, she grew up in poverty, right, Dr. Patterson? Yes, and I just share with you that although we were very impoverished as a family here in Mississippi, we didn't feel that way because we were in a, a in a household where I had a loving mother, a loving father, and the children, you know, lived together and did positive things within that family unit. So we did not feel impoverished, although we were. Right. Right. You had what you need. I think so many people think that having what you need means having a lot of money, having a lot of possessions, material things. But what you really need is stable nurturing. Yeah, absolutely. And when we look at these qualities in a home and in a community, they don't show up as much as we'd like to because we all there is this adversity. So it's really important to be purposeful, to build the kind of home and environment and communities that Ruth was talking about. Sorry, Dr. Patterson was talking about. And we one go of by the, first name. Okay, <laughs> good, good. That's great. Um, so, you know, when we think about family resilience and parent-child connection and those healthy relationships, we work on defining that. And when those are present, even at high levels of ACEs, children are more likely to flourish and and also be ready for school and engage in school and have healthy social relationships themselves. It's really clear in the literature. And family resilience is made up of things like staying hopeful, even in difficult times, knowing and looking for the strengths that you can build on. And also, when you do have problems, reaching out to each other and to your community for support and working on problem solving, not necessarily going with your first instinct, but getting support from others is really a big part of creating that resilience. And when that happens, even with that high adversity, we see vast amounts of improvement for kids. And even if they don't have ACEs or illness without those qualities in the home, they also don't do well. So it's not just about adversity. It's also about these are needed for everyone. So listeners, I hope you heard that, that that just because you experience adversities doesn't mean that you can't be resilient and flourish in life. Just because you don't have adversities doesn't mean that you will flourish unless you have the right other things in your life. So I think, um, Dr. Bethel, as we were stepping through this, um, you said there are some things that you can you can have that that make you able to flourish even with adversities. So. I know somebody out there is listening to this and they're thinking, well, how do I stay hopeful? How do I how do I impart that in myself? Do you have some advice about that? Absolutely. I mean, just take a second to first say that 
in, we've done studies with adults who had a lot of adversity. And when they look back on their lives and recognize that they had, you know, adults who listened to them when things were hard and in the school or the community felt belonging, that they're 72% less likely to be depressed. These are called positive childhood experiences. So how can we as parents or adults build positive childhood experiences? And it really comes back to your own well-being and also recognizing that you may have adversity, that it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened, and to start to really work proactively on building those qualities of flourishing in yourself, a sense of hope, a sense of meaning and purpose. And for me, it's very important to know how much you matter every moment to Mm -hmm. your child and to everyone around you. Mm -hmm. Our relationships, moment by moment, are creating our our well-being, literally. And so if you have adversity to work on, you know, that sense of mattering and healing, but um, building in your homes a sense of hope, practices, they're really practices. You have to kind of on purpose say, how can we build our hope? How can we look for our strengths? How can we stay connected when things are hard? Wonderful. And that's something I think we all need to listen to. And this isn't just so listeners, again, I want to make sure that you understand this isn't just about children. It's it's about we as adults. And and if we are not hopeful, and if we do not have the ability to think about the positive and reset things, then certainly we're not going to impart that to anybody else. So as we're stepping through the show today, I want us to make sure that you think about as we are sending out tips on what you can do and how perhaps you can help children out there, whether they're yours or some some other child out there who needs you, to think about how you can do things for yourself also. So listeners, if you experience difficulties at a child and you are thriving now, how did you how did that happen? How do you think that happened? Why do you think that happened? Was there one person who helped you? What are some of those positive childhood experiences that happened to you that you think set the stage for your life later? It could be a teacher um, in your life. It could be a neighbor, a grandparent. Is there a support group that you can depend on? Is there someone out there or something, some entity that you really go to, your go-to? It, 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 could, be, it could be a podcast or it could be a, a teacher or a church member. But I'd like to hear from you and, and share that as we step through this. Thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and I'm here with Dr. Christy Bethel and our entourage from Mississippi Thrive. We're talking about flourishing. How do you do that? How do you have good health, good, good mental health, and also have happiness in your life. And how are you able to center when things are good for you? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that and um, find out more. But I want us to, to talk just for a minute before we get to our first caller um, about some other things Let's kind of reset, if you will, on the on the flourishing and the adversities and how even if life is difficult for us, we can still be okay, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the research is pretty clear that it's about relationships. And that starts with a relationship, of course, with ourselves. But if we've had adversity, our relationship with ourselves might not be as healthy as it needs to be, a sense that we matter and belong and really being on our own side. So we need each other to help um, create the sense of it's possible. And so that's one thing. But when we look at longitudinal studies of how people with similar levels of problems do, it really comes down to the relationships they had. And so what makes up a good relationship um, is really a 
an important thing and to proactively work on that, to not assume it. I think it's really common for people to just assume that if we're not sick in some, like we don't have an illness, that we're well. But if you look at how we did define flourishing, having that sense of engagement in life and purpose and good relationships and all of those things, we have to actually put our energy into that. Mm -hmm. And so how do we do that? And it's often through the people we are around and the thoughts we think and what we expose ourselves to and knowing that no matter what, we are precious and we are loved um, at the deepest level. And so But that's often what's missing when people don't flourish is a sense that they matter and that if you didn't have that as a child, it's not going to be in you. And so how do you restore that? And Mm -hmm. it's really through relational relationships. Relationships. Mm -hmm. And um, to to learn how to do that positive Mm self-talk, to look in the mirror and tell yourself, I matter. Yeah. I'm good. I'm okay. Yeah. And And to have somebody look at you like you're there. Like, so we have this secret uh, power, like that. which I call just being present. And mm-hmm. it doesn't mean physically being there. It means really bringing your full heart and just being with mm-hmm. each other. And we know children need that as well. And that's why when we study the positive childhood experiences, which maybe I can just share a few of what they are, one is feeling that you um, it's safe to talk about your feelings mm-hmm. with somebody mm-hmm. and feeling like when things are hard, somebody's on your side. Oh, gosh. Having an ally, I think, is one of those incredibly important pieces that, you know, occasionally I'll I'll see a child who come into the clinic and the child's sitting there and um, will hear so many negative things about the child and you'll see the child begin to shrink. And yeah. I always try to interrupt that. Yeah. So that they they don't have to listen to all the bad stuff right. about them, and and sometimes the way you do it is just to say, okay, tell me the best thing about your child. Absolutely, and even if a, a child is upset about something, I always um, say that, that whatever we're upset about, it's because of something we want that's good. So right. if a child's upset, Absolutely. it's because there's something they want that really matters to them. So yeah. focusing on, well, what were you trying to make happen when you got upset just there? And they were like, well, I wanted to stay playing with my friend or I wanted, mm-hmm. you know, something positive. And so how do we take what's hard and go to the root of it to stay focused on the positive place often from which our pain arises. And I don't know if that right. makes any sense. but it makes perfect sense. <laughs> well, let's go to our first caller. We have Steve in Clinton who has a childhood memory to share. Hi, Steve. Thanks for calling. Yeah, hi. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to share, you know, as, as, as a child growing up, we, we weren't impoverished by any means, in my opinion. But I remember having, you know, my sister and I, my sister was older, and, and we'd get up every morning before school. And we'd both stand on a little piece of cardboard, and we'd draw around each other's feet with a crayon. And then my sister would cut the crayon, the shapes out, and uh-huh. we'd put them in our shoes so that our socks wouldn't get wet from the holes in the shoe. Oh, wow. But, you know, I thought everybody did that. Uh-huh. You know, I didn't, I didn't realize that uh-huh. we had holes in our shoes because we didn't have a lot, lot of money. I thought everybody did that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so it, it didn't scar me. We had we had a good support group growing mm-hmm. up. So, Steve, what was your support group? Tell us a little bit my, about My that. mother and father, and, and then my grandmother came to live with us. And, you know, it was just, you know, I was surrounded by loving, support, supporting mm-hmm. people, and, you know, we, we didn't dwell on what we didn't have. We, we concentrated on what we had. We always had plenty to eat. Steve, um, yeah, did did you have a garden or ha- tell me how you had plenty to eat? Because it sounds like you you didn't have a lot of money. So how did you have plenty yeah. to eat? We, we we had neighbors, and you know we had some of the neighbors fished and hunted, and we could get you know everybody shared. And then you know our next door neighbor had pecan trees, so we always had plenty of pecans and it wasn't until I got older then I realized how expensive they were. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but we, you know, we always had enough for food. We didn't we didn't drive the fanciest cars or live in the nicest neighborhoods, but you know, we we, 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 we were doing great in my opinion. I was just a child. Yeah. 
Steve, that is wonderful to hear. And, you know, you you said something. You made a statement that I think we all need to remember to repeat as we can. Instead of dwelling on what you don't have, dwell on what you have. Dwell mm-hmm. on those positive things that you have, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that is a message that we all need to keep in mind as we move through life, whether it's we we haven't achieved the job that we wanted or whether it's that we haven't achieved, you know, been able to buy the car that we wanted. You mentioned that. so. <laughs> That's right. Listeners, we'd love to hear other other thoughts that you have um, about those positive childhood memories. How did you make it, Dr. Bethel? Yeah, it's so inspiring to hear your story and also you, Dr. Patterson. Um, one of the things that we see when we look nationally is that about half or a little less than half of children actually live in homes where families really experience these qualities of resilience. So it's a fortunate thing when we can keep that hope alive and focus on strengths and reach out to our neighbors and our community and really help know that we can find solutions. But we have an issue of sort of intergenerational or, or some kind of accumulation where we're in a bit of a state of needing to be so proactive. And that often happens in community, you know, in churches, in community, and then also how we are in healthcare. For me, it right. was really my doctor. And my when I was a little kid, I went to the doctor a lot, and it was my doctor that really looked at me like I mattered and understood what was going on and tried to help. So wherever it comes from, through any door, we really all need to know how much we matter to the well-being of children and helping the family find those strengths, stay hopeful, and be willing to receive support when it is available. Yeah. Dr. Bethel, I know you and I have talked about this in the past. You, I think when, when people hear us talk about how you should stay positive and stay hopeful and that you can, you can flourish even in, the, in, the, in, in amidst adversity, I think sometimes people think, yeah, yeah, you say that. That's what you study. But you never walk the walk. Well, you did. Yeah. You walk the walk. Yeah. And if you don't mind, would you share a little bit, um, if you feel comfortable, mm-hmm. about what what that walk was? Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you were an amazing, productive, happy, fun-to-be-around person. How'd you do it? So talk to us a little bit about that, if yeah. you will. Well, I guess I'll go back to the beginning. Yeah. And I was born in the late 60s and lived through the 70s and 80s and was in a family where there was a lot of substance abuse and mental health problems. And yet I had a grandmother who seated in me very early in life that um, God and I were one. <laughs> uh-huh. And you don't always know what that means. But I was definitely taught to go in and to um, seek support. And that there was support and also to go out. And so whenever I was able to go out and meet other adults, somehow I got also from my grandmother to ask for help. You know, Mm. sometimes we needed food and I would knock on doors and ask for help and in church and got involved in things and was really stayed after school and helped my teacher. And so for me, it was really more the community, the school, the church, because it didn't really change at home. But the other thing that I really noticed was that um, nobody was really helping my mom. Mm-hmm. You know, even all of our programs, nobody was really trying to help her. Mm-hmm. And so I think how we do, how we try to help families that do need help, because she had a lot of adversity too, really matters a lot. Mm-hmm. So, but that's how I really thrived was being involved in life, being given the direction to do that, and also having a deep inner life. Mm-hmm. And relationship with God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So again, turning to that positive um, self-talk. Mm-hmm. So your grandmother gave you the tool. I know she wasn't around mm-hmm. all the time, mm-hmm. and 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 didn't pull you out of that situation. But what she did do is give you tools mm-hmm. to survive within the situation. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That that sounded very very difficult. So. When when we are are looking into things, listeners, 
uh, I'd like to hear from you if if you can. You don't have to share that the adversity, but maybe share with us if you don't want to share the adversity. Share with us how you came through it. What what did you do? What was that one supporting piece? Um, that are that one supporting person that was there for you or if if you are someone you know is out there who who does have uh, perhaps an entity that can help that can be the support can be the reach then I'd love to hear from you too um, for the same reason so Dr. Bethel if you will go back you know you you have a, a statement that you say, we are the medicine mm-hmm. solution. Talk to us about that. That yeah. sounds really interesting to me. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's really literal at every level. So when we're born, it's our relationships and that attunement with the child that helps build their brain well, as you know, and all of that. But also as communities, we really have more within and between us that we can do that we don't tap into. Mm-hmm. We often sort of you know, aren't vulnerable when we need help or somehow shame ourselves or don't connect. So the very things we need to be well, especially today in our society, are within and between us. And so we really are the medicine in that way. So how do we create a society where we bring forth what I think we're built for, which is to not... um, shut each other out, not shut down our own pain, but to bring it forward. And, you know, when we look at those positive childhood experiences, there are many things we could have looked at, things like, oh, I had fun in parks or something. But what it really came down to, the pack the punch for health impacts, was um, really feeling you had someone you could turn to when things were hard, and also um, a sense of belonging in school that you participated in the community. And without those things, like I said, even if without adversity, you were still likely as an adult to have problems with mental health and social issues, not having good friends, if you didn't have that. So it's a kind of an emergency that we grab a hold of what we're needing to create within and between us. Yeah. Uh, you know, as as you were talking, I was thinking, um, Lauren Elliott and I have talked about this so many times, you know, having that one person sometimes, I, I grew up with a, in a nurturing family, I did, mm-hmm. and we had all that we needed. Um, but but I because I was from a big family, I was the third child of eight. And I um, there was another little sister who followed right behind me. And I think parents were a little bit overwhelmed at times, maybe a lot. Um, I didn't go to kindergarten. And many of the kids, when I entered first grade, many of the kids had been in kindergarten, most of them. And I can remember, this is when I was six, I can remember walking into the classroom and being absolutely terrified, Mm -hmm. Um, feeling like everybody already knew what to do. I had never had to sit in a desk, and I had to sit down in this desk, my feet dangling off the desk, because I'm tiny, I always have been, and and being terrified. And Miss McKay, my first grade teacher, recognized that. Mm -hmm. And she came over to me, and this still makes me teary because it was the mm-hmm. sweetest thing. She came over to me, handed me a little stuffed animal, and she said, this is your friend who's going to keep you company and keep you calm. Okay. And no matter what you do, it will be fine. Absolutely. And you know that we think those are little things, but the little it things aren't little. It was And they're huge. often what we remember. And yeah. even when we study so what they call social determinants, things like poverty mm-hmm. or experiences of racism mm-hmm. or food insecurity or not having a safe neighborhood, and compare them to the impact that these relational factors mm-hmm. have of having the kind of relationships and safety and stability and good mental health, which is really what flourishing is in many ways. It's positive mental health, not the absence of a bad thing, that it's really the relational things that seem to be predicting the health outcomes, like whether it's an illness or a mental health problem in a child or not being engaged in life as a child or an adult. So I always say let's focus on building up the positive so Mm -hmm. that we can then create a society where we can address the social issues that can help all people thrive and have their needs met. 
Yeah, so that was that's the really incredibly good news. And you know, I think when originally all the information came out um, about the adverse childhood experiences um, and the the health outcomes, it, it sounded so negative. Mm-hmm. And and I I remember thinking, well, is all lost? if you experience those and so your research is showing Mm -hmm. that it's really not yeah and there's no magic bullet either so it's not like you have to do this kind of positive experience the common denominator is they're all relational and so who you are every moment matters the teacher the bus driver the grocery store everybody matters how they interact but there isn't a magic bullet it's cumulative so Uh. if you have more of those things whether they're in the home or in the community we see the impact. Same with ACEs. It's, it's, Same it's with not ACEs. the specific exactly. thing. It's yeah. the accumulative toxic stress. Yeah. It's the accumulative trauma. So it, we have this cumulative positive. And so the more the better. And that means everybody that's in the presence of a child or a family can help. Mm-hmm. It takes that village. But, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes I say it takes a city. Yep. Thanks for listening with us. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Dr. Christy Bethel and our Mississippi Thrive Entourage talking about flourishing. How do you do it? How do you do it when you have adversity before you? There are ways. And just because you have adversity doesn't mean that you won't do well. And the flip side to that is just because you don't have adversities doesn't mean that you will do well. It 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 means that you have to have the positive thinking, the positive centering, and you also need to have support structure. And support structure is probably one of the most important to know that you belong, to feel that someone cares about you so that you feel like you have some self-worth. You know, we talk a lot about um, during the COVID times how mental health has just plummeted for so many. And, And some of that I firmly believe, and I'm sure, Dr. Bethel, you believe this too, some of that is because those support structures have not been in place, as closely in place, because so much has been done remote. So many times we've withdrawn. And what I've seen is, even though we obviously still have COVID going around, but things have loosened up as far as masks and not having gatherings, I still see that lack of connectivity mm-hmm and closeness that people used to have. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the biggest outcomes of trauma of any kind, whether it's in our childhood or in society, is to withdraw. And yet connection is what we need to thrive. And so we just want to be aware that we can build it. We can lose it and build it again. Resilience and all these things are like the weather. You can It changes. It changes. And so you can do something. And, you know, often the response to trauma and difficulty is to not stay open to others, to not ask for help, to not even recognize that you're having. That's why if you know what flourishing is, you can recognize if it's there or not. So you right. have this idea that I wake up to be engaged in life and I want to. If that's not there, there's things we can do. That's not like a personality um, characteristic to not care about life. That's actually a sign of needing to connect and reach out. Right. And and one of those things that we do, sometimes we do to our ourselves almost by not being able to recenter. And you call that the biological mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. markings, the biological centering. Mm-hmm. There are things that 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 we can do. You know, at, during the break, I was telling Christy that when I go into a doctor's office, sometimes I might be anxious mm-hmm. about just getting there on time or anxious because I just waited 30 minutes and I really don't have time to wait. And so when I sit down to get my blood pressure taken, mm-hmm. sometimes it'll be a little elevated. Mm-hmm. And I'll go, wait, wait, give me a minute and I'll make myself do the deep breathing, the centering, thinking about something really positive. Listeners, I know you've heard me say this over and over again, how you can do this and how you can calm yourself Mm -hmm. and how we can teach others to calm themselves if you just make yourself 
calm your brain, calm your mind, make yourself take those deep, long breaths, concentrate on how you can slow your heart rate. It really happens. Almost always mm-hmm. can lower it by 10 points. Absolutely. Almost always. Mm-hmm. Isn't that something? Yeah, it's amazing. And um, we have we're, biological embedding is something we know. Our experiences affect our body completely. There is no you know mind-body gap. <laughs> right. And that's true if it's positive. We're very exquisitely sensitive to the positive. So if somebody, if you're not having a good day and someone looks at you and smiles, it changes your whole being, your neurochemistry. Mm -hmm. We have so much power to help each other. But the other side is true, too. And so if you know that's happening, that means first you're aware of your body, which often isn't the case. Like you're not aware you're not breathing. You're not aware you're anxious. But when you do... Doing these breathing and grounding and also remembering there's others around who probably will care about you if you reach out, if it need, if you're needed. But I also love to share about what I call finding the jewel. That So when you were in the doctor's office mm-hmm. and anxious about 30 minutes, it's because there was something you really cared about that you wanted to be able to tend to that was important. Right. And so when you focus on the positive, again, that underlies most of the anxieties we have, it's because there's something we care about that's mm-hmm. right to care about. We want to be on time. We want to do the thing that we're expected to do. We want to have peace in our home. So when we're upset when things aren't peaceful, it's actually because we care about peace. Mm -hmm. And so to always remember that no matter what, and then to go to the place where you can feel your own body and breathing will always elicit the best in you. Beautiful words. And it really will. And that's something that I think our listeners who listen regularly have have heard that and listeners i hope you've practiced it i wonder if um love to hear from you if you if you do practice it and if you feel like it has given you some positive results share it one eight seven seven mpb ring that's eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four Lauren Elliott, I know that you have done a lot of this because we've talked about it. Do you do you feel like that you are able to do some of that self calming and and the Yes. Yeah. I do. And it it takes practice. You know, in the beginning when I really came into this world about five years ago, um, some of this stuff sounded very woo-woo to me. You know, I wasn't very comfortable with it, and it was like, okay, Mm -hmm. really? But the more and more I've read about the research and the more and more I've practiced deep breathing and really just centering Centering. and thinking about Mm -hmm. um, being calm, it it really works. It's it's truly remarkable. And and there's a really cool app that I use. Um, There are plenty of them out there, but there's a very... um, very heavily researched science-based app that I use um, called Healthy Minds. And uh, they take just little um, five-minute segments, and you can do it in the morning while you're getting ready or, you know, driving to work or whatever. And it just helps you really start the day in a peaceful, calm way. It really it really can make a difference. And, you know, I have... I have a couple of older grandchildren now, 13 and 9, 10, and and we've talked about that for them, too, when you get upset about something, what you can do. So you can learn to do this very young, and it's really important. The other thing that I think is really important to teach children early on and to teach ourselves, because... Dr. Patterson, you'll probably agree with me with your your grandchildren and your children that if if we if we don't model that and if if our children as parents don't model that then then their children will never learn it. So that modeling is so profoundly important. And that's why whenever I do a show about kids, I like to remind everybody that, that everything works for adults too. Mm-hmm. The behavior management, it works for adults. We just have to do it ourselves. Mm-hmm. Dr. Patterson, do you have, have you tried to impart that in your children too? I'm sure you have. Absolutely. <laughs> and I tell you, the most wonderful gift I received from val- val- for Valentine's Day was from our oldest granddaughter. 
And it was a matter of my husband and I, we usually start our morning, our day with meditation and a little bit of scriptural reading. And we try to live out whatever that scripture speaks to us. Mm -hmm. For Valentine's, our granddaughter gave us this card that says, we appreciate so much because your faith is what you live every day. So to me, that spoke to me. They see what we do. She value what we do. And she seeks to imitate that as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that that is a, a wonderful, profound example of how modeling and you know, I think so many times I've I've heard parents say, Well that doesn't work. They don't see it. But they do. You just continue to be the model. You continue to do it. I laugh a lot. Our Kids, um, we were talking about this yesterday during a a talk about managing childhood behavior. Um, My kids already always knew that that I really meant business and I wanted them to behave when I quietened my voice, when I talked more softly. I didn't yell. I just lowered my voice, got a little bit deeper and a little bit softer. Mm -hmm. And then they knew, okay. It's time to stop whatever we're doing and move forward. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a wonderful way to not have to be yelling all the time. You know, we had five kids. It was like there was uh, chaos time. And so how how to make a model that works, you have to do it repeatedly. You can't just do it one time and say it doesn't work. It has to happen over and over again so they see the pattern, right? Yes, and I really would like to share at this time that um, my youngest um, was a kind of a difficult baby, and before he was one, he had learned to take really deep breaths when he would get really upset because we would practice over and over and over when he would get angry and upset. And so when he was two, when he was three, he would, you could see him stop himself, take a deep breath and then breathe out Uh and then try to move on, you know, amazing, but it's because of the repetition and the, the modeling and it's not going to work one time and it's not going to work every time. It's not going to work only one time and it's not going to work every single time, but the more and more you practice and the more and more they feel Mm -hmm. that regulation, the better. Well, let's go to our final caller. We have Rich in Gulfport with a comment on things we can teach our kids. Hey, Rich. Hi. This reminds me of the last time I called, which was a couple of years ago. Oh, wow. The happiness program. Yeah. Well, thanks for calling back. Well, I have a couple of thoughts uh, for happiness. Uh you're addressing it for children mostly, and that is ask them frequently, do you like what we're doing? Do you like mm. this? Right, what do you like? And, and encourage that, encourage uh, what they like. Uh, and uh, I like that. The other thing that we have to, have to do, I think, uh, as far as children is concerned, is to uh, teach them that it's okay to fail. Oh, absolutely. It's okay, it, it, it's okay not to get a uh, perfect score on some test or not to finish a reading assignment in school or whatever it might be. Or it's okay to miss a tackle in, uh, in, in, in playing soccer or football. Uh, it's not the end of the world. Mm-hmm. The, only, the important thing is that, you, is that you're doing your best. Mm-hmm. Wow. That is so true and interesting, Rich, you say that. I was on the phone with my daughter this morning about her wonderful, wonderful daughter who um, was upset because she wasn't the best at something. She said um, she's in track and soccer and that there were these individuals. And we had exactly what you were saying, Rich, of talk about that. Mm -hmm. It's okay not to be the best. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there will always be somebody maybe a little better or uh, a little faster, but that's okay. As long as you're doing your best, that's all that counts. And so um, I know, Dr. Bethel, you had some comments for Rich. So, Well, mostly, Rich, I just think, you know, 
you don't have to be a researcher to figure these things out. And you you hit the nail right on the head on both the things. The first thing about encouraging asking what you're experiencing is so important because we may think children are doing well, but if it's really what they experience. That's what's knocking around in our nervous system all our lives is what do we actually experience? And so being curious about that helps them tap into that and know, well, what am I feeling? And so I love that. The other you talk about, sometimes we call this a growth mindset, mm-hmm. like basically mm-hmm. staying Staying in the game when things don't go as you thought because you're learning and growing and knowing you can develop and it's about the experience and the growth and and a lot of a lot of that it doesn't exist all the time we have what we call a fixed mindset where we're like well I wasn't good at that so I'll never be good at that or right. I wasn't good at that so I'm not gonna be good at anything and so to keep in this develop kind of in a developmental mindset where life is a continuous journey of growing and learning and not having to always get it right. Love it. Growth mindset, listeners, remember that. Rich, thank you so much. That That's great information that we all need to remember. We need to teach our kids. We need to teach ourselves because I think, uh, right? You're spot on. It works for adults as well as kids. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for calling, Rich. Well, Dr. Bethel and others, in in the last minute that we have, talk Mm -hmm. to us about what you'd like to leave our audience with. Yeah, I mean, I would love to just... um say that you you've mentioned many times that the the, how well you're doing as a parent or a caregiver or even a doctor or a teacher Mm -hmm. matters a lot to how you're going to be able to show up in a way to help support children or even your you know friends and things like that so it does come back to being connected to yourself and also we talk about the inner ability to calm and all the exercises we can do but just as important i think is reaching out to one another and being um, vulnerable to ask for help well thank you so much and we are so honored to have you visiting with us and i just want to let everybody know that you will be hearing more about our early child development coalition the mississippi thrive ecdc that will continue its work to bolster children and support our community so Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bethel. Um, Southern Remedy is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting, Think Radio, and funded in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center and support from our listeners like you. If you'd like to hear this show again or any past, past episodes, you can listen to the podcast on your favorite app by searching Southern Remedy, Relatively Speaking. The show is a production of MPB Think Radio and engineered by my producer, Jay White. I believe our call screener was Jermaine Flood. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking right here on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone 